Hello, Barry. You're on the show. Welcome. Oh, hi. Thanks for taking my call. Sure thing. Now, we're not recording, and this... Well, we might be recording. We're recording, but we're not broadcasting. Yeah, this is not broadcasting. So if you... It's okay. I don't care what, whether you're recording or not. I just wanted to ask a question. Sure. I'm trying to understand about the uh, Christians' um, idea of what laws they're supposed to follow if they believe the Bible. I, I'm an atheist, mm. so mm. I'm not trying to um, argue. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, and I wanted to understand whether their idea, the Christian idea, is that they're not liable to follow the uh, commandments in the Old Testament, uh, but only um, in the New Testament. And I've, I've been looking this up. I'm really curious. And I found something that said that, and I'll read it to you, the various New Testament scriptures uh, stated that uh, Christians are to obey the law of Christ rather than trying to remember the over 600 individual commandments in the Old Testament. Um, so, Well, speaking from my experience, most Christians, and even just expanding this out to all sorts of different believers, whether they believe in, in Allah or some some Hindu god, usually people are not that familiar with their holy book in the first place. So let me just throw that out there. And And for the people that are, they are usually just familiar with the rules that they like, and they tend to follow the rules that they like, and they're unaware of the rules that they don't like or... They may have been exposed to it, and they just dismiss it. So in my experience from talking to hundreds of people who believe in gods and refer to holy books as the reason why they believe, it's, yes. it, they're very selective. People are just generally selective. And this isn't just a, a, a theistic thing. I think humans just do this naturally. Am I allowed to mention a, a, a political figure or a name or not? Yeah, yes. Okay, for example, because I've been watching politics and what's going on, and someone like Mike Pence, who claims to be so religious that he will not attend a, a function where there are women unless he has his wife with him because he's afraid of the thinking about adultery, which is a very minor thing, I think. But on the other hand, he's constantly lying, so he doesn't follow even one of the commandments in the Ten Commandments about um, false witness against your, uh, you know, they're, they're both laws and how he can follow one and not the other, unless this is right that they don't follow anything in the Old Testament. That's a good point. And it's a reason why I don't even quibble with people about what their holy books say. Because people will pick what they like and they follow what they like. They're, they're, generally, it seems that people are constructing a version of their deity in, in the form that they want it to be. So there will be a, a slew of Christians that would laugh at Pence for his position on that, and there's a whole bunch of Christians that think that he's a noble person and, then, and he's setting such a fine example. It's, and frankly, I think it's a waste of time to argue with people about their lack of following directions from their holy book. I don't even get into it for that very reason because people will twist those words around to fit their idea of what it should be. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing with anybody, because I, I started to when I first, um, years Deep ago, when, when I, I realized that I was an atheist, and it was, mm. uh, I, I wasn't changing anybody's mind by arguing with them, I was just making enemies. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. Uh, so, but but I, I, I have a, uh, a strong desire to understand this because it's so important in, in, in the world today. Uh, that what, what, For example, if they don't believe in the Ten... If the Christians think that the, old, the Ten Commandments are not applicable to them, why are they fighting to have the Ten Commandments displayed in courthouses and in uh, city halls? Mm. So I think I'm sure it's not the Jews requesting that or the atheists. Yeah. So so I think one of the things is that this plays into the pattern of how they come to conclusions about what is right and what it, God's will is. I'm speaking now somewhat specifically about I mean, specific examples of uh, modern American Christians, particularly the evangelical movement. But I think that just coming to conclusions based on faith. Uh, 
that this description applies to all those instances, which is that they come to a conclusion and they are correct. And so when they're presented with new information, it's not, should I consider my position? It's, how does this new information, that I've, uh, how is this new thing that I've heard um, fit in a world where my conclusion is definitely true? And one of the easiest ways is, no, it's not, no, it's false, you just need the Holy Spirit. This person is presenting something that doesn't match with what I think, therefore they don't understand it, and I am correct. So they don't go to the Bible to find truth, they'll go to the Bible when they're not sure maybe about which car to buy, or like whether, oh, what is my right path, and then they'll find a passage that they can sort of Rorschach test into the conclusion that their, their mind will supply for them. But it, for them, it's not really like, a, oh, let me go back through and read this. It's almost like a, a series of cultural norms that are passed down in a kind of social identity that they would say, oh, no, I'm a Christian, and that means that I am a good person and that I go to church on Sunday and that I do all of this. Whereas if you're speaking theologically, Christian would usually mean, I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross to save the world from original sin, right? Like, the, the fact that you could believe that and then also not go to church on Sunday or be particularly nice to other people. I think you hit on a good point that yeah. people generally, they have these beliefs, mm -hmm. they know that there's some book that is a source of truth, at least they think that it is, and then they'll go to the book and they'll f they happen to find a verse that backs up exactly what they were thinking would be the right answer. So, I, I think I mentioned it before, I think it's a waste of time to argue with a person about their inconsistencies or their cherry picking. Mm -hmm. Ask them how they determine that this book is a source of truth mm -hmm. and focus on that. That would be my advice. Yeah, I, 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 I agree for the most part. I feel like you can get to that part of the discussion. Obviously, you have more hours of experience talking to people on the street about this than I do. But I feel like there's a way to get to a, well, you're not reading the whole book necessarily, you've found these right parts of this book. And so I'm wondering how often you do this. And like, so getting them to think about the way that they come to conclusions, I feel like is, is definitely the better way. Yeah, just, to just get people to start talking about yeah. their belief and how they determine that it's true. Mm -hmm. And what is so compelling about this book when somebody else can look at it and come to a completely different conclusion? How can we figure out who has interpreted it correctly? And if we can't figure it out, then is it honest to be confident that what you're believing in is true? So, okay, Barry, thanks for your call. I think we'll jump over to Thank the next call unless much. you have anything more for Barry. Um, Do we have no, any more callers in the queue? Oh, no, we, we've, got a, we've got another caller in the queue. I would just okay. say, depending on how much you want to talk to people to help them uh, sort of escape this, right? That's the, kind, I, the language yeah, I, that I use in that description is kind of aggressive I, I don't sounding. think I can help anybody. I was just trying to understand. Oh, well, yeah. And, um, you've really helped me to understand. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, there's also the book. Thank you very much. Oh, well, yeah. I think he's eager to go. Thanks All for right. calling, Barry. Really. Pr hey, by the way, how did you hear about calling yeah. us before you go? I, I am a big fan of your show, and I watch on YouTube, but I'm sure that the ones I'm watching on YouTube are two, three years old. I just had no idea you were still there or when you were there, but I called the number that I see on the YouTube uh, screen and somebody answered, so I was delighted. Oh, nice. Yeah. I yeah. was about to ask which, which show, because this is the, the Atheist Experience studio, but Anthony has his own uh, show as well. Um, if you'd like I'm to... I'm looking at to one that shows it's Matt like... Dillahunty and Jen Peoples <laughs> <laughs> on the screen. That's the Atheist Experience. Yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah. And I'm glad that you called, too. Yeah. And okay, if you Google you. Anthony Magnabosco, you can see him having lots of conversations with this. And if you yeah. listen to those... You Are you going to be watching live at 4.30 Central Time? No, I, I just go to YouTube and I, bring, and I, I put up Atheist Experience uh -huh. and I get all of these... Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Ones yeah. I just click on, click on them as I, dig, as I go along. We're going to be live broadcasting in about four hours. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to show a couple of examples of the conversations that I have with people mm -hmm. uh, if the, everything works yeah. out right. right also, issue. Barry, if when you go to YouTube and you search that, there's actually, the Atheist Experience has its own YouTube channel, and you can get an update when we go live and when we put out new episodes. But I, if, I, Can you tell me how to find that? I'm not very knowledgeable about 
I just type on YouTube, mm -hmm. and because I've been watching it, these just come up. Right. But I don't know how to find your channel. All right, so if you type into the YouTube search bar, Atheist Experience Channel, then in the okay. results... Oh. oh, he's doing it now. Yeah. Atheist Experience Channel. <laughs> okay, I'll try that. Yeah, Thank just you very subscribe much. and yeah. turn on notifications and you should get alerts whenever we go live. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And feel free to call in again at this time next week or uh, at 4.30 Central today or next week. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Barry. Thanks for calling. Okay, thanks. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Bye. And then, yeah, you Do can drop him. Yeah, yeah. And then that one's David and they're still uh, working with Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did that mean a call was ringing in? Is yeah, that, that's okay. what that meant. All right, David, we're going to get ready and go to you. So here we go. David, welcome to the show, the pre-show. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, how you doing today? Man, I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call, guys. Yeah. Sure. It says um, here that you're strongly associated with Satan, and you want to... <laughs> No, I'm sorry. My humor is far too sarcastic for this early in the morning. <laughs> this is early. Yes, sir. Um, wow. <laughs> the, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, we're just we're just yucking it up over here. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, not really. But. Sure. So, um, you know, like I said, like just like Barry, I'm a big fan of the show, and I'm, I yeah. also came in via the YouTube way. I actually, you know, watch some of the. I basically watch some clip or version of the show almost every night. YouTube's always suggesting a new version, and it's it's really helped me. I'm I've never been the best debater, and it's really helped me. Um, with strategies and things to think about and, and also how to be, because I'm in South Carolina, it's really hard mm -hmm. to be an atheist over here. So you know, to do it in a kind manner, and that, that's really my goal, mm -hmm. unless, of course, there's, you know, hate or bigotry involved. Um, so a lot of the times when I'm having these debates with people, it goes, it ends up going a certain way where, you know, I feel like they, they, they are getting in a corner and they basically come out with, well, you're just under the influence of Satan um, and you need to, you know, seek Jesus. And you know, it goes something like that. Mm -hmm. and of course, I can say, well, that's not really fair. Um, you know, that's you're basically using you're, you're basically using something from the debate we're having uh, to justify your position or to invalidate mine. And I just and generally that will kind of shut it down. So I was looking for a, a clever rebuttal, uh, which you guys are so good at um, to kind of you do a soft sell that, you know, that, that's not really fair. And, and, you know, I want to, you know, continue the debate, but, uh, without, you know, without having them shut down, which mm -hmm. I, I guess it will, we're not the point that can may already be happening, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically just what I was calling in for today. I have a couple pieces of, of advice. Um, number one, maybe try to recognize when the person that you're debating with is getting a little irate and maybe you're, you're dropping too much on them. So the, the I guess my first suggestion would be perhaps end the conversation or the debate with them before you get to the point where they start to demonize you, literally. <laughs> um, that would probably be my first little bit of advice. And then second, uh, I mean, you can always tell them that you, you, you also don't believe that there is a such thing as demons and, uh, you know, ask them if they, are, if they are bringing that up because they're uncomfortable continuing the conversation. Did you hit a nerve? And then maybe you can talk about why they're trying to characterize you in that manner as opposed to just becoming all defensive and saying, well, no, 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 I'm not a demon, and why, do you, why are you accusing me of such? Uh, that might be kind of one way to go about doing it. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want okay. to add. I, no, I, th I think that's good. I feel like um, instead of addressing that sort of statement that comes out of nowhere and doesn't really relate directly to the conversation you're having. And like again, bringing it back to, well, you're, you're stating this, I feel like I'm not going to, I don't want to continue a conversation if I've struck a nerve or I'm making you uncomfortable, but I feel like that's a way of uh, avoiding what we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to try and continue to have a conversation with you if it's one way and you don't want to talk about what we've talked about so far. Um, particularly if you know the person, uh, they'll be able to see that you're talking in a way that's friendly and that that's not a way that they think Satan talks, presumably. Yeah. Sure, and that's, that's definitely I, I, my goal. I think a lot of this, too, is just leading by example and just demonstrating to them that you are a good person, that truth is important to you, that you're being respectful to them, that, uh, you know, when, you're, when your dog is sick, you take it to the vet, and if your car needs to be watched, you're just a regular person mm. who who just cares about people, and you're not there to cause them strife, but you are there to ask them challenging questions. And just be upfront with them and say, 
you know, it, it, it gets a little discouraging when I hear somebody wanting to characterize me in such a manner, but I'm not the devil. I simply want to believe true things, and I want to challenge how you are concluding that what you're concluding is true. And, and, and maybe they will see you for the human that you are and take your word for it, and you can progress with the conversation. But there are some people that just say that because you did hit a nerve. And, and they don't want to continue, and it's easier to demonize you than to address the challenges that you've presented with them. And right. sometimes the best thing you can do is try to end the conversation or the debate on good terms and take a break. Come back in two or three weeks and say, hey, now that we've had a little time in between, can we pick up where we left off? And they may, they may engage with you again. Uh, don't just go in denial mode. Well, I'm not the devil, you know, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. They might become more suspicious that you are. So um, take it <laughs> yeah, slow. That, like, that play, play, and, play the long game, David, would be my mm -hmm. advice. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's what I'll do. And that's what I forgot. I think I left out an important part was that one of the, the common rebuttal where they think they just shut it down is, you know, the greatest trick the, the, the devil ever did was, you know, to the world was prove they didn't exist. I think that was from a movie. And that's what I just, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of, and they, they kind of get really smug about that. And I'm just kind of like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know how to, to I don't know how to, to rebut that without yeah. uh, doing what you just described. And I guess, like you said, I think it, we're already at that point. Maybe it is best just to take a break. Yeah, to take take a break, play the long game, because in the end, the thing that's going to help them is the ideas you can present. And the more that they can attach those ideas to you and you to the devil, the less they're going to engage with those ideas. Well, with the the devil, the non-existent like idea. The way I said that made it sound like there's an actual devil that we're talking with. But um, <laughs> the, the more that, like, like, if they start saying that, you can be like, well, okay, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that. I, maybe we can continue this conversation, but if you don't want to, I feel like we already talked about some good things. Because the more that you can say, look, here, here's this information, here's this conversation we had, and I'm going to leave you with that in such a way where the only real thing that you can deal with or try and object to is the conversation we had. And if you have that conversation well, then they're not going to be able to say, oh, well, those words are Satan. Yeah, it's interesting how people will equate questioning and doubt with Satan. Mm. And questioning and doubting things, we use it all the time. But they're making an exception for this cherished belief that you've been debating with them on. So you, you might ask them if, you know, if a salesman came to your door and was making all these claims about this wonderful vacuum cleaner, would you just believe it or would you question it? And would questioning it be equivalent to the devil? Uh, you can try to, try to help them find ways in which they're questioning things just in their regular everyday life. Very, very few people just believe everything that they're told. Mm. Questioning is, is, is a virtue. And, and perhaps you can even shift the topic where you're talking about a time where they did question and it was beneficial. Like shift the discussion a little bit if you can, if they're still mm -hmm. willing to engage with you about the benefit of doubt, the mm -hmm. benefit of questioning, mm -hmm. the sense of wonder yeah. that, <laughs> makes, that makes this world beautiful mm -hmm. and, and it helps us believe things that are true. Yeah. That and if, if they're not, like if they've come to a point where they're not willing to engage, like, like you just said, with like religion directly, making the conversation just about thinking is the best way to do that. So, yeah, broaden it like, out. Like, move it would, from the... Would questioning the value of this particular vacuum cleaner mean that it would be equivalent to working for Big Broom as a conspiracy or whatever, or trying to destroy right. the vacuum cleaner's integrity? No, it would just mean you're thinking about it before you believe it. And if the salesperson warned you to not question what he or she was telling you, mm -hmm and trying to demonize you for doing so, wouldn't that raise some alarm bells? Like, yeah, I think you can probably reposition this in, in a natural sort of everyday situation, bring mm -hmm. it completely away from the God thing, and just start, talk, start talking about the benefit of questioning and doubting, and, and when those things are beneficial. When you're walking down the alley, mm -hmm. and you hear a noise behind a dumpster, I even think I've even heard Tracy Harris use this uh, metaphor to some extent, mm -hmm. It's usually beneficial to start questioning, to start wondering, to start making preparations, and and that's a good thing. That that's a good thing for humanity. Agreed, and I, and I think that's a, a great point. Trying to take that what we're you know the, the position we're in and, and bring it into a everyday situation, like the vacuum cleaning, the, the 
yeah. the broom thing. That, that's actually quite clever. I appreciate that. Uh, sure. I mean, if you know this person well enough, you probably have examples where maybe you were out fishing with them and then somebody made a claim about a lure. Mm -hmm. Go back to that example and, and just start talking about that. Like, yeah. choose safer topics that, uh, that show that you're a regular, everyday person mm -hmm. and you have their best intentions in mind. Or you meet a new fisherman that you didn't know before, and they're telling you that they've caught the biggest fish that you could have ever seen, and it was this big. My arms aren't even long enough for it. And you might, instead of saying, oh, yes, I believe that. You're clearly a better fisherman. Notice, like, oh, okay, are they even wearing good fishing gear? Does their reel even have a hook that can do that? Like, I mean, again, I'm, I'm circling around to the same thing, but there's lots of, lots of types of conversations you can have. That's a great question, right. David, yeah, that, though, because, yeah, that, that could be a real deal breaker when somebody paints you in such a negative light mm -hmm. because right. you know that you're not the devil and just right. going on and on about how you're not is not going to convince them probably. Mm -hmm. You have to try more unique and clever ways, and I think that was a great question. Yeah, because right. not saying that. I'm and not the devil what? is what the devil would say, so. Yeah, probably. Right, all right, that's the, that's the and, and me being the minority over here, it's just, it's, it's mm. you know, it's, it's hard. So I just, uh, you know, and again, I appreciate all the content you guys put out there. It's definitely helped me uh, become more confident in my position. And, and real quick, Anthony, you're the, you're the, you do the, the street epistemology, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah they're bringing me on yeah, today. I've seen your stuff before. I have, I have definitely seen a few of your things, and I, and I just wanted to say that was a, a very honorable, uh, have a lot of respect for you when you came across a guy that had a lot of life hardships and you just stopped. Um, that was that was really awesome of you. Mm. I'm trying to remember which one that is, but yeah, sometimes I'll do that. It was a guy on the street, and he just like he was talking about his mom had just died, she had cancer, uh, and he was just r rattling off a long list, laundry list of mm -hmm. just things that was going wrong in his life, and you just kind of was just like, well, hey, have a great day. I think you actually offered to buy him something, like a, a meal mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. You just completely backed off on the... Uh, you know, where where did you get your God belief kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just, yeah, that, that, I, that was very admirable, I thought. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Yeah, we're going to be live. Uh, I'll be on the show with Tracy in about three hours or so. Four. Four hours. Yeah. We're testing out the equipment now, so we'll be able to show okay. some examples. I won't be showing that one, but we'll be showing another one. Uh, thanks for watching both shows. Appreciate okay. it. Hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. Yeah, it was a great question, dude. Thank you. Okay. All right, bye-bye. So I brought three clips with me today, and they're from the same individual that I've talked to. Her name is Carrie, mm -hmm. and this is, I think I recorded this almost two years ago, but it was such a good talk that I ended up putting it on, uh, on my YouTube channel as the first video that people will see. And I initiated a, a talk with her. It turns out that she believes in God, reincarnation, and souls. And the main reason why she thinks that they're true is because she feels that it's true. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, this clip that I want to show, it's three minutes long. It's the longest of the three clips that I'm going to show today. But it kind of sets up where we are in the conversation. It kind of sets it up where, sorry, it doesn't set it up. This clip starts near the end of the talk mm -hmm. where I'm asking her essentially how, how she could be so sure that it's true. Mm -hmm. And what I think makes this clip really interesting is how honest she is, how respectful we, we both are in the conversation. We're listening to each other very intently. And, and uh, you can see the results here. So with that, let's go ahead and roll clip number one, please. Is it possible that the souls and reincarnation and even the God yeah, yeah. in the slightest yeah, possibility yeah. could not I'm be also true? Not sure whether... I mean, anything could be true. There we go. Some people believe that. We got some I calls too. It's, I mean, is our sound going to go over the. That's what I was now, wondering. But Can I we talk? feel very strongly in my heart of hearts that what I believe is true. Oh. You know, having science degrees and everything else, it's, it's you know, there's, there's always a chance that you're wrong. Is there a chance that you're mistaken on the God belief? I don't think so. Is it possible? I don't think so. I think there's something beyond. I truly, truly feel that way. Thank you so very much. <laughs> that was really enjoyable. I guess it's not 99 or 100%, but, you know, I guess there's a, always a short, you know, 0. .0005 chance, but it's interesting. Are you saying right now here at the end of the talk that 100% confidence is not the most representative spot 
on the confidence of your belief? I don't know. That's a good question. Because now I'm thinking back to where you said, you know, you believe 100% and then you, at the end of the conversation you don't believe. I guess, you know, I think you're right. I guess, I guess there's always a small chance that, you know, there's nothing. But I don't want to believe that. Does why? that make any sense? May I ask why you don't want to believe it? Because it's just, it's a sad thought for me. It's very, it just makes me sad. It makes me sad for me, it makes me sad for my children. That there's nothing that I want to believe that my soul, my energy, what animates me, what makes me who I am is going to go on in some way. You know, I, I truly believe like the whole thing that energy is not created or is not, you know, created or I can't remember exactly what the word is. But it's neither, it just goes neither created on. nor destroyed yeah, or exactly. something. Yeah, exactly. But you go on. Somehow that life force goes on. I want to believe that for me. I want to believe that for my children. Do the things we want to believe always mean that the belief is true? No. No, like I said, there's maybe a small chance that that's, that that's not the case. But, but I think me not wanting to believe that do you I want to ask me a that. question about the clip, maybe? What do you mean? I'm sorry. Dismiss the possibility of that, small possibility of that. You dismiss the small possibility that it might not be true? Yeah, or I don't think about it. Okay, it's over. All right. All right. Clip is over. I think we're getting a little echo in here. There we go, right. we're back. There it is. And we're back with the Vern Show. So that clip ran you know, about three minutes long, and uh, you know, we were really trying to understand each other. I was repeating back what she was saying, and she was being very, very honest about her beliefs, which mm -hmm. is really a, it's really a treat when you encounter mm -hmm. somebody that is willing to honestly look at their beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, and we see that a lot on the show, where people don't want to honestly examine. They just want mm -hmm. to preach. They just want to evangelize what it is they think is true, mm -hmm. but they're not willing to examine it, and it was quite different with her. Yeah. yeah. That's where the phrase, like, oh, you're not respecting my right to have my opinion comes up. Mm. Just like... I have two more clips, and, and it, the third clip goes into how much she liked the conversation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but before we get to that, maybe we should take another call. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, how long did it take to put the captions on that video? That was a three-minute clip. That probably took me about an hour to put on. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's worth it. Like, I'll try to add some on-screen wording. Mm -hmm. Well, because, number one, I think it helps underscore the importance of what's being said, mm -hmm. whether I'm asking a question or somebody is saying something. Mm -hmm. And then also, people that are watching the videos are from around the world. So a lot of them are not native English speakers. Mm -hmm. But being able to see the words written out in English, I've been told, helps people. So it's, uh, there's a lot of different benefit for, for doing it. So when, when I consider the thousands of people that will eventually be watching it, it seems to be worth the extra effort to put those on. Mm -hmm. Some people find that they're distracting. And if that's the case, I, I will offer an, an alternate version where mm -hmm. they're not on there. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I kind of like adding them. And, and it's interesting too, when you slow things down and you're typing what's being said, even though I've watched that video 30 times, mm -hmm. I still picked up on things that I didn't catch just because I was putting it into text form. Yeah. So it's an interesting exercise all around. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, one of the things I find when I watch like a movie with um, subtitles is I find them distraction for, distracting from the action. But I feel like if it's a conversation, then I, I would mm. want that to have happened. Yeah. Because her shifting her weight is a lot less important to the conversation than, you know, Jason Bourne blowing up a car or whatever. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good point. So we've got the call for Stephen. He has an argument for God. Stephen, welcome to the show. You're on. Hi. With can you hear me? We yeah. can. Stephen, how you doing? Hi. I I'm a little nervous. Oh, don't Hi. be. Don't be. What keeps you busy these days? Oh, I, I was just looking up apologetics, and I, I wanted to ask, have you heard of the Kalam cosmological argument? Yes. We have, yes. Yes. And, and, and what do you think of it? Does it... Do you want to explain it in 30 seconds just for people who aren't aware of it? Can you go over it real quick? Sure. Sure. Um, premise one, everything that has a beginning of its existence has a cause of its existence. 
Premise two, the universe has a beginning of its existence. Therefore, premise three, the universe has a cause of its, of its existence. Premise four, if the universe has a cause of its existence, then that cause is God. Therefore, premise five, God exists. Mm. Is this an argument that you find convincing? What I'm, what I'm really interested in is, did you believe in a God before you stumbled across this argument? Or was this the argument that was the main reason why you think that your God is real? Well, it wasn't what convinced me at first. I, I was raised in the church, and, and I recognized that. And getting older, I, I wanted to get to know my God more. I wanted to learn more and, and, and get to know more about God's creation. And I had questions. Hmm. And so that's how I wound up finding your show, by the way. And what you. convinced me... I think questions the, are great. The, well, the Kalam, cosmolog the Kalam cosmological argument, I feel has a very powerful standing in a, a very basic question that seems to be asked a lot on your show. That's why I wanted to ask what you think. Sure, sure. Do you want to jump in? Or? Oh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to, but I feel, I feel like uh, my, okay. the approach that I would, I would generally take is, is very different than you. Yeah. So what I'd really like to just revisit, if you don't mind, Stephen, is... Mm -hmm. And I, I love the idea that you're questioning and you're seeking out other resources and you've even stumbled across this show as a resource in your journey to figure out what's true. I, I admire you for that. What I'm wondering, though, is if you hadn't discovered the Kalam cosm cosmological argument, I'm even stumbling across saying it, would you be just as confident that the God exists now that you have this argument? Or were you equally as confident that your God existed, that your God exists, prior to discovering the argument? Well, it's not so much a, a question of confidence as much as it is getting to know more of God's existence. And the more I get to learn about how our Lord has done so much and, and, and how this world has been put together, um, I, I'm, I'm fulfilled spiritually. This isn't a confidence question as much as it is filling in those gaps that people ask. And, and it seems that your show includes a lot of these questions and a lot of these gaps. It does. And I, I wanted to present the Kalam argument as just one of those. Okay. I, um, I actually, I, I, as, as far as more convincing evidence, I do have... Um, well, uh, several prophecies that were so real made quick, through we, eventually Stephen, for the Bible. Stephen, hold, hold on, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to interrupt uh, so abruptly, but I did want to talk a little bit about the Kalam cosmological argument because when you began this conversation, you said, "Oh, I was just looking up apologetics," which mm -hmm. makes it sound like you had a belief and then you were going to find reasons on the internet why you should continue to hold it. And I'm more interested in talking about why you believed it before that right like what what was well, what what originally convinced you because you said well, you were raised in the church and that uh um that that's what originally convinced yeah. you but there are not just apologetics for jesus well, and the christian me, god let, or the jewish god let me answer but that. Allah let me answer that. i'm sorry what's what's your name jamie Jamie, this, again, like I told the other gentleman, this yeah. is not a question of, of how much I believe in, in the faith that I have, but when you're in, on fire for the Lord, when you want to share the, the fruit of what God has given us, you do want to look into it more. I assume that's why you're doing what you're doing. Okay. You're on okay. fire for your religion, atheism. And Hold on one second. That, well, then we've got you. a couple things to respond to there, Stephen. All right. So, yes. I understand, I think I understand what you're saying. And what I think, I, what I think you're saying is that you form this belief in this God, you believe that it's true, and it's inspiring you to research it even further. Is that where we're at right now? Yes. 
Okay. Yes, I think that there's, that's a fair assessment. Okay. So what, what we're interested in is how you're determining that your God is real. Is it really the argument from the Kalam argu uh, cosmological argument that is, that is convincing you that your God is real, or is it something else? Hmm. Well, let me think about that. Take your time. I do see what you're saying. I, I, I was raised in the church. I obviously had this belief beforehand. I would be lying to you if I said that wasn't the truth. Though mm -hmm. so I don't think that precludes that from being true. I think the way that I came to this knowledge, I mean, um, I, I saw a clip where Mr. Dillahunty had said, you can come to the right Oh, how, how did he say it? You can come to the right answer for wrong reasons, and you can come to the right answer for right reasons. Yeah. I just think it's ironic that he came to the conclusion that he came to. But well, Matt, I, I, Dillahunty's not here today to, to talk about that. But yeah, I think, I think what you're getting at again problems. is that a person could arrive at a belief using an unreliable way, for example, being raised and taught it, and it still be true, even though that isn't probably the best way to determine if something is true. Was that the point that you're making? In response to your question, yes. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's a, it, I think as far as when we're living our lives, it's also important to try and find the best path for uh, determining what's true, right? And so even Jamie. outside this particular question, it's important to find the best method for determining what is true and applying that to all the things. And if you look and so, at the history and so of human my, my discovery and understanding, question what you believe critically tends to be yours. Hold on, Stephen. Stephen, did you, uh, did sorry. You, Jamie wasn't quite done yet yeah, talking. Did you, I, I was just hoping you heard the last parts of what I said. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just pointing out that if finding the best method to determine what is true and using that throughout our lives is, I mean, kind of by definition, the best way to do that. And so if you're using uh, one method to determine, oh, this God belief, right, and you're not willing to apply it to other parts of your life, that's interesting. Right. Or if you think about how question. questioning your own beliefs critically and re-examining them is, you know, on a larger scale, why we have cars and planes and the internet, and on a smaller scale, how people avoid sending money to princes in Nigeria, then it might be wise to consider using that for other beliefs that you have. And if I can just bring this full circle, if uh -huh. you don't mind, and, and then we'll wrap it up and move on to another caller, Stephen, is that... Uh, I would imagine that we would probably agree that a person could be raised with a, a belief in a completely different God and stumble across the same apologetic arguments that you've stumbled across and be just as sure that a completely different God exists. And to tie it all in you know, with Jamie's point, are those, are those methods of being raised that way and taught it and then also stumbling across arguments the best way to determine if something is true, the most reliable way, the most consistent way to arrive at the same result. And if it's not, then it might be time to reevaluate the methods that you have been using. Well, that, that was the question that I asked you, um, was how are my methods so different from yours when I'm going online and trying to research and, and do that, I'm even calling you. I'm, I'm trying to do this research. How is my methodology so different that you would consider it wrong? I mean, I, 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 I don't know who said it, but uh, cars and phones in the internet, like I'm some kind of archaic idiot. No, that's this not, isn't, sorry, isn't, I, I, Stephen, I, that's not what I meant when I brought that up. I was talking about I mean, how the application you, of this method to the natural world is... Result. Okay, and so how is how is that so different from from the way I'm looking at it? That feels like you're holding me to a different standard that you hold yourself. Let me try. Let me try it this way. Let me let me let me try it this way. Now, I, I was not raised atheist, but if I was raised atheist and I were to have stumbled across arguments 
to justify my atheist position, would you be willing to accept those reasons for my conclusions? Or would you think that I was mistaken? I would withhold judgment until I've seen all sides of the issue and find what is most compelling Good. and go with that. Yeah. But I think what he's asking so, is, would you say, oh, fair. he'd reasoned well if he'd been raised atheist and then continued believing atheist and then thought, oh, I should find arguments on the internet that support my belief, and then that's sufficient for me to conclude, yes, I will hold my atheist position. Or would you want him to look more critically at his position? No. No, that, that, that is the standard that I'm holding myself to. That's what I call to get your opinion on. If, I mean, I feel let me like ask you about, it, one, one last question. Hold on, one last question. The, the point here, though, is if somebody used your same standards, mm -hmm. would they always arrive at the specific God that you believe in? Or would they, is it possible that they can arrive at a different conclusion? I believe that they would come to the same conclusion I did. I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Stephen, but the method you're describing is also the method that Muslims use. Well, and we, can, we can argue this back and forth, um, but I, 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 I do... Call the right show to argue back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I think at this um, point it would well, probably yeah. be good just if we wrapped it up, Stephen, but mm -hmm. uh, we have another call here that we want to take. Uh, take some time to think about it, and if you want to email the show, uh, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Hi, Tom. How are you? Doing good. How about yourself? I'm um, not bad. Not bad. Hanging in there. Rock on. Well, you wanted to call in. What did you want to talk to us about today? All right. Um, a couple things. Uh, first thing is that I was okay with not believing in God until somebody thrust the Bible upon me, and I started reading, and I started looking, and I started research, and I started doing all this, you know, excuse me, this, you know, things I should, shouldn't be doing. I'm pretty sure you can say you shit on, 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 on this. Well, oh, I know. I just, That's okay. You know, I kind of, you know, kind of keep a little respect factor there. Oh, we're godless um, heathens over here. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable so, with. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the way I look at it, the, I start researching the Bible, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get into details, but I've read it, and I, I came to the conclusion that it's just like Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a good guy, bad guy kind of situation. There's no education factor in there. There's no, there's no reality in it. And I hate to say it, but if there was a reality, then we would, like I, like I was uh, speaking to uh, Eric, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who was the one who took my call earlier? I am. I think I am. Oh, speaking. probably Mark. Maybe Mark. Mark. Oh, Mark, yeah. So uh, I told him about duality, how people have two mindsets. One mindset is the evolutionary mindset going into school. So as you're growing up, you're, you're three, five, six, you're going through the education system and you're taught evolution. You're taught the planets go around the sun. You're taught all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, Sunday school. It, there's a duality here. There's a there's a difference of opinion. You got the believers and you got the non-believers. There's a conflict, and the non-believers are the ones who actually start all the wars. Well, tell us a little bit I about. I believe that. Can you I, tell us a little bit about how you felt when you discovered that there was this conflict going on. Oh man, um, I was 33. My father died, and what happened was I discovered. You know, somebody told me, like, you know, he's in heaven, this and that. I'm like, what? I said, like, what, what are you talking about? I said, like, he's dead. Like, he mm. died. Mm. So mm. to make a long story short, that's when I started reading the Bible. Mm. Okay. You were motivated to read the Bible after your father passed away and people started telling you that he's moved on to a different life. Yeah, did did you a different world. He's in heaven. You yeah. know, he's did you find the answers in the book? I, you find Jesus died for your sins, and I didn't know I was a sinner. I didn't know I, I was such a bad person. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Until I read that book, God, I'm evil. You could call me a demon. Um, it makes no sense. How do we call? How do we call you a sinner? 
And the guy who lies consistently about facts, call him a righteous man. Sure. So let's... I, That's what bothers me. You can well, catch a man in a lie all day long. Uh, sir, I'm, 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 I'm a little... Yes, yeah. I think I'm with you. Like the the book doesn't really make a lot of sense, and, and I, I don't limit that to just it doesn't the Bible. match up to reality. Right? Can I ask why why it's um it's so frustrating to you, and and why you can't uh, acknowledge that there's discrepancies? Okay. What what is it about the book? Can, yeah, go ahead. I, I can I can explain. Um, Please. The first thing is when you're taught a certain way growing up an intelligent, thinking, critical-minded uh, way of growing up. You're taught that. And then all of a sudden, it shifts for some reason. Mm -hmm. There's a shift in your mindset. There's a shift in your thinking as you get older. Because you're older, that means you don't, you can't critically think anymore. You know what I mean? You mean the older that you're getting, the less... The less... Uh... The the older, you, the older that you're getting, the more you're being pushed to believe things that are not in, li in line with reality? Yes. It's, I, I don't know why that is. Hmm. I don't know why. Like, for example, I have to accept the biblical version of this world around me. As I'm walking through the woods right now, I see nothing but trees, nothing but, you know, a pathway that we created, so forth. Mm -hmm. So... We're pushed to believe a reality that doesn't exist. Or maybe it does, but it's not of our knowing. I remember watching one of uh, um, Matt's uh, episodes, mm -hmm. and Matt would say that, how can I know something I don't know? How do I know there's a reality above us? How do I know there's a reality below us? I'm a little confused, honestly. You know. If I could just interject. Are you saying that yeah, your perception of reality is getting worse as you get older? Because you're being taught all these things that are not, probably not true? Just, yeah, just being told what they are. And I'm like, nah, I don't believe that. I believe in medicine. I believe in... Okay. Uh, well, why do you... Why, you, don't, you don't believe everything that you're told, do you? No. That's why, that's why I'm in a, a worse situation than I ever was. Why are you in a worse situation in, now? I'm, because what happens is, like I said, your mind shifts. I, I don't. I can't explain it. Maybe it's an evolutionary thing. Maybe it's a, a psychological thing. I, I'm not sure. Are you around? Mind shifts. I'm a little curious. You're you're calling from Philly. Yeah. Is that right? Philadelphia. Okay. Are 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 you involved in any local freethinkers groups or or atheist related communities? Because honestly, it, it sounds to me like you might be better off if you were around people who were faced with these similar questions and, and do challenge yeah. reality, do challenge yeah. the, the, the magical thinking that we That's tend to well, see. Yeah. Are you in any groups like that in your area? No, no, I'm not. Would you consider it or, or even like an online community? Yeah, I consider it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might really help yeah. you out, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Uh, and then you can, you can make a post in a, in a, in a, some sort of forum or group, or even meet with people face to face, and express your your frustration. Because more than likely, other people have have gone through it, and they could probably give you some good advice too. Yeah, absolutely. I'm 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 definitely open to advice. I'm just not open to. <laughs> Listen, when I research the, the guy you had on previous, like his, he, he was raised Christian, right? Yeah, he was raised. Uh, as a Christian man or Christian uh, boy. Um, mm -hmm. He said, you know, and then you try to find arguments that fit your belief. But what if it's the other way around? What if it's the other way around? What if what we see is what it is? Mm -hmm. that, that's it. Yeah. Not what you believe. Yeah, we see a lot of that where yeah. people, people come up with a belief or they were taught a belief. And then they'd look around and they, they try to find things that fit the belief. And yes, I do yeah. think that, that uh, that's sort of backwards, that, it, that we, should, we should investigate our surroundings, investigate reality as best we can, mm -hmm. and then form our beliefs after. But it's backwards. The, ma it the majority of our population in this country, at least, seems to go about it completely different. Very good.
Well, I guess you can't do nothing about it. That's the problem because you don't know what somebody's thinking. Well, have you the know? have the conversation with people. You know, they're it's hard you, because you know what every every one of my family believes. Mm -hmm. I, hear believe. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, bud. Like, uh, I hear you. Well, what about but this? You may have to widen your yeah. circle. You may have to widen your circle a little bit to find people who sympathize with your frustration, who do view things differently. Yeah. And I think that would really help with the frustration. No, I, I, I'm frustrated in a way, but I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because I read a, a book that, I mean, literally, I mean, I heard from giants were coming out of the Antarctic. I heard UFOs are everywhere. I mean, mm. this book will make you think everything and anything. There is a lot of broken That's thinking. scary. Yeah, it is scary. That's scary to me. It is. Because you're, you're thinking it, and you're, you're, and, and you're not with reality. <laughs> as soon as you start thinking that way, you're not rational. You're not a rational person. The mind is an interesting thing. And, and I don't think that these people, you know, these are human beings doing the best they can with the brain that they have. And our brains are, have a lot of flaws. These are not perfect working bits of machinery. I know. They're, they're, we're, I know. We're, we're, we're subject to all sorts of different biases and, and, yep. and misinterpretations of reality. And, mm -hmm. and dialogue and questioning, I think, are the best ways out of that. And find I community. Agree. You know, Circle yourself with community who, who's been through this and can help you and give you advice on how to yeah. cope with this, this nonsense that we're seeing. Because it is frustrating, dude. I'm with you. It's one of the reasons why we do this show. Yeah. I, I can't speak for, for my co-host here, but um, yeah. you know, we want people to see that, that there may be a better way of, of going about coming to conclusions and that there is value in questioning. And there, it's a wonderful thing to, be, to have a community where you're surrounded by others who, who are sick of this broken thinking that we see on a daily basis. I'd, I agree. I'd actually like to add in here, um, also valuing some things that just make people uncomfortable. I mean, being able to say, I don't know, is really, really difficult. I mean, um, but most, I'm sorry, often we find that yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, when you say if, that, go ahead. When you say that to a believer, mm -hmm. it, it, the worst part about them, the worst part about a believer is they believe that you're weak. Right. I and swear so, to, I've seen it happen. So I've valuable. seen it happen where right. yeah, treasure it, it treasure where, it in your own life because when you're doing that, you're yeah. giving that small bit where you know you're helping give them the tools to navigate through the rest of their world, right? Yeah. I mean, by yeah. living your life that way, um, by continuing to question, by continuing to withhold and say, "You know what? I don't know." And then going and, and looking through that, keeping that intellectual honesty makes you yeah. a model for that. And you may not get credit for it, but as people see that there is value in saying, I don't know. Um, but you know, you're right. Uh, you're right there, Tom. A, a lot of believers think that you have to be certain and you can't question because questioning is equivalent to doubt. And it's better yeah. to make up something and pretend that you know than to admit that you don't. And that is a big, that, that is such a big challenge that we have to overcome. We need to teach children that it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to question. And let's go out and find the answer together. And, and we just Absolutely. don't see that. So that's, that's why we have these shows, is to promote this mentality, to pro promote this different way of thinking so that the audience can watch it and, and it yeah. will just change and, and expand outwards and hopefully make a difference. Uh, it does make a difference. Because when you hit a snag and when you hit a snag in the road or whatever the uh, expression is, mm -hmm. you you start challenging your own not your own belief, but what you do know, your knowledge, your own knowledge. Yeah, and it's and a liber it's a liberating thing once you realize that. Oh, it's it's a relief when you re when you realize that you don't have to know everything, that it's okay to say I don't know. That is a stress reliever. Yeah. Like that 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 is that just is a great thing when you come to realize that it's okay to say I don't know. And in fact, I think it's so, virtuous to say that you don't know when you don't. Yep. Absolutely. So pretty much knowing and that's like I said um 
You know, a lot of, like to be honest with you, a lot of my family members kick me out of their house because I don't believe. How old are you? It's unbelievable. I was uh, thirty-seven. Okay. Well, yeah, I, there, them, I, like, I really don't. I really don't believe. I mean, <laughs> your really your your lack of a belief and your way of seeing uh, seeing uncertainty as a virtue is scary to people because you are a reminder to them that you don't believe and that there are people that don't and that's a threat they are they are so they're so inculcated with this belief that to come across somebody who doesn't and you may be a, a real it's petrifying to them and they they may say hey you know tom is such a good guy he goes to work he, he supports his family he does this he does that he donates but he doesn't believe it's it's a it's a real threat just you saying you don't believe is a big, big threat to people. And, uh, but I think it's important. I think it's important. If, yeah, if you're out, uh, that's great. It said here when you called in, though, that you wanted to tell the difference between secular and religious. Did you want to go into that? Secular and religious? Where, oh, you? Yeah, I, I know, yeah, I know the difference between them, uh, them two, two uh, groups, yeah. Uh, religious, I know, well... Like I said, I have a couple. I have a couple of questions, and re- like I said, in reference to how the reality relates to what a book says, and it's it. As soon as I started reading, it didn't make sense to me. Even then, I read it, and I'm like, all right, I got to believe it though. If I believe it hard enough, I'm like, oh my god, it's going to come to me, and it never came to me. Some people think I that was better, if you just yeah. believe something strong enough, you can make it true, and that is that I, is just dangerous. I can't. Yeah. Well, welcome to the club. My heart, yeah. my heart wasn't in it. My heart was not into it. And that's that's the scary part. And like I said, a lot of my family did not. They didn't take that well at all. And I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I wasn't raised Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Catholicism is a subset of Christianity. I was raised Catholic. Yes, I was raised Catholic myself. Yes. Well, and 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 you. Even when your heart is in it, you know, when you come to yeah. realize that, you know, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I can, I absolutely empathize. Um, before I left the church, um, I thought there must yeah. have been something broken with me. And that was definitely yeah. the narrative that uh, other people in my church pushed was there must be something wrong with you because you don't and you're, you're, you're unable to, to just take it on faith. Before, right? be, before you go, um, Tom, I wanted to mention yeah. that there are support groups sure. that are available for people like you who are frustrated, you're surrounded by others who, who believe this magical yeah. thinking. Uh, you can go to recoveringfromreligion.org. They have, sure. uh, you can chat with live agents who have been trained. You can, you can telephone them and speak with them over the phone like you're doing now. Um, I have even created a little Facebook group. Uh, oh, it's, yeah, it's one eight four. I doubt it. Um, just search for recovering from religion, and you'll find that their website. Yeah. And then there are a whole slew. You, there are ex Christian forums, people that were raised with uh, with uh, Catholicism, excuse me, and no yeah. longer believe. And uh, there there are people out there that that will see they'll understand where you're coming from. And I think a lot of your frustration will go away once you discover that there are a lot of a lot of people that are just as frustrated as you are. Yeah. And they're coming up with solutions too, which is even more encouraging. Okay. So it's not just a, a gripe fest. Yeah, it's not just, yeah, exactly. We're, we're talking about, coming out. yeah, we're talking about real solutions to change things, to improve things. And that's really exciting. That is, that, that's good though. Um, I'll definitely uh, look into that and uh, appreciate you guys talking to me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Sure thing, Tom. Thanks for calling in. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good, you have a good uh, weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to drop. And then if we want to move forward. Let's go to Jared. Yep. Jared uh, is calling in from, looks like, Phoenix, and he uh, has some questions about the definition of atheism. Dig it. Let's dig in. Let's dig it. All right, Jared, you Hello, are on the air. Jared, welcome to the show. We're, we are recording, but we're not broadcasting. Okay, cool. And I'm getting a little bit of uh, clicking from your line, just so you know. That better? Ooh, Keep well, talking, and we'll tell you. <laughs> All right, how does that sound? Can you hear me loud and clear? Testing. It's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's pretty good. So what did you have for us today? 
first of all, I wanted to tell you guys an awesome show. I believe I hear Anthony's voice here, don't I? Yep, you have Anthony Magnabosco on the line. What's up, Jared? Awesome. Great to talk to you, Anthony. Good to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to call in about the definition of atheism. I think mm. you and I are largely in agreement. Um, but yeah, what, what would you say the best definition of atheism mm. would be or the definition that you use? This is a contentious thing these days. We might, we might have some. We might have some differences. Yeah. Um, let me hear your definition. Sure. Yeah. So, in short, it's the rejection of the um, proposition that a god exists, mm. um, and that's it. I mean, it's it's basically the proposition is, you know, um, I believe a god exists, mm -hmm. and my answer is, I don't believe you. It it, it doesn't it, atheism itself doesn't take on anything any other baggage, right? There's nothing else. I mean, you have a lot of uh, atheists who are into woo and crystals and mm -hmm. spirit healing and whatever other bullshit um, that are still legitimately atheists if they don't believe in atheism. Gotcha. Right? Um, the main thing that, in your mind, to be an atheist is the rejection of the claim that there <clears throat> is a God. Yes. Okay. What I think, I well, don't know for sure, but uh, Jared, are you getting to the whole lack of a belief or belief that there is no God? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, uh, so when you talk about rejection, mm -hmm. are you just saying, like, I don't believe this? Or would you say that, I mean, I think that atheism would typically best be defined in terms of theism. So, I mean, theism would be sure. a proposition, mm -hmm. true or false, the belief that God exists. It sounds like that's what you were doing. And I yeah. think that atheism would be the affirmatory position, which is, or I'm sorry, theism is the affirmatory, yes, it does exist. And atheism is, no, God does not exist. Which means atheism is actually making a claim about reality that reality doesn't contain any God. Mm, okay, actually, I I've got to step in there because that's not that's not actually it. Atheism is sure, with, no, without a theism, right? So if you wanted to um, to continue on to what other people believe, I mean, if you want to ask an atheist what they believe, um, in the God Delusion, Richard Dawkins puts out a seven point. Um, scale, mm -hmm. and uh, there are other scales that I find really useful, but if you were to be on the atheism side of that scale, um, at the very end of it, the hard atheism would be the assertion that no gods exist, right? Um, if you were listening to our talk with the last caller, uh, we were talking about the value in saying, I don't know, right? Um, I think that the vast majority of the atheists that I've talked to would say if given concrete evidence that a deity existed and there's it's irrefutable we're not going to not i mean it's they're open yeah but but right. in so the I, absence of evidence the best thing to do is say i don't know and continue to live your life but jared i think you said something interesting that that my ears picked up on and you said something like atheists will say that they know there's uh, that there is atheists will say that there's no god did you say that um, I would say that atheists believe there is no God. They believe there is no God, right? Yes. Okay. So I, I think I think I'm on board with you with that definition. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm on board. With, I'm on board with you on that definition where atheism, or an atheist, is a person who uh, believes that there's no God. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't mean we believe it to absolute certainty. This doesn't mean we claim it as knowledge. Right. I mean, I think right. all of these. I thought you said something like atheists say that there's no God, and that implies that we're making a knowledge claim. And there's a big there's a uh, distinction there. So yes, atheists have a belief that there is no God, or believe that there's no God. Some might even say that they that, hmm? they would believe that reality contains no gods. Well, I, I I think we're starting to get into. I guess this. so. I guess I'd be okay with that. Are, you're an atheist. How would you... Someone says, okay, Jared, what is an atheist? How do you describe it? Someone who believes gods don't exist. I'm fine with that. I'm a from... Yeah. I, I, have a, I have a belief that there are no gods. I'm comfortable saying that. There are many people who say that they lack a belief in a god. Yeah, that's non-theism. That's still atheism. That's non-theism. I mean, 
a it theological gets... non-cognitive lack of belief, an agnostic, a temporal agnostic, a Huxleyan agnostic. Those are two different positions. I mean, they're all under the umbrella of non-theists. I'm, I'm a non-theist because I'm an atheist, you know, but mm. I'm not an atheist because I'm a non-theist. Yeah. When I hear the word agnostic, I'm starting to more interpret it as undecided. I'm undecided whether I know that there's a God or not. Um, I yeah, I mean, Dillahunty gives a perfect example about the jars on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, is it odd, e, or an odd number or an even number? Yeah, the gumballs. And odd or even mm -hmm. would be atheism or theism. And before looking at it or making any judgments, maybe measuring the jar or something like that, you can say, I don't know whether it's odd or even. And that would be kind of the on-the-fence agnostic position, not saying it's odd or even. Right, open and undecided, I guess, is probably a good way to equate with agnosticism. Actually, but that would be more of a temporal agnostic because that's saying more about your your ep epistemic certainty. I would say that you know a Huxleyan agnostic would be making a stronger claim than that, saying it's it's unknowable. You know, there'd be there'd be the distinction there as well. But that's getting into the different types of agnostic. Mm. I mainly just think that as an atheist, it, we should be you know supporting the burden that the slight burden we have. I mean, of course, it's not quite as heavy as a burden as theism, that's why I'm an atheist, but right. I would say that the position atheism is the proposition that gods do not exist. I wouldn't say I, it's a, a knowledge claim. I think that knowledge is a pretty... I think it's, I think it's bordering on it pretty close, though. The way that I like to approach it, and, and if you go to my Twitter profile, you'll see this, where I, I, I like to ask people where they are in terms of their confidence that a god exists. I think that's great. From zero to 100. And I put myself at a two. I have a very low confidence in, in a belief, in my belief that a God exists. So I guess you could argue that I do believe a God exists, but to a two degree, <laughs> to, to a very low degree of confidence. And, and maybe these labels can be very confusing. So maybe some numerical scale, like the Dawkins scale, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. or, or the zero to 100 a scale. I think the real number works good. Pardon me? The real numbers works good, like zero to one hundred, yeah. and like zero zero to one. I would say I'm like point nine 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 yeah. that the god of theism doesn't exist. But if you're giving me some watered down, epistemologically unaccessible theistic god, I would say I'm at like point five five. You know, I can't mm. get any information for or against that. Yeah, just on my intuitions, I would base. Yeah, I like that. So, like a yeah, for like a deistic god, maybe you're just a little higher on your on your confidence in the belief. But uh, the god of the the Christian the Christian god of the Bible, then maybe even a lower degree of confidence, closer to zero. Is that what you're sure, saying? Your beliefs proportion to evidence. You know, the more yeah, the more strong you can say your belief is, the the more strong the claim is that theist is making. Mm -hmm. We'll say the stronger belief that I have that it doesn't exist. Um. Now, that being said, I do still use the agnostic atheist moniker. Yeah. Um, be because I, I, I understand the difference between knowing and believing and all this stuff. Absolutely. But when you start really thinking about what it means to know and um, knowledge being a subset of belief, mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, maybe just putting it on a numerical scale, at least for me, seems to be clearer. See, for me, it actually... I think it's clear that the agnostic atheist label only works if you're using the strong atheist or the mm -hmm. proper definition mm -hmm. of atheist. It's there's, a lack of belief atheist. Yeah, just there's... Incoherent. You know, have you ever watched uh, Ozzy Ramses, Ozzy Mandius Ramses yeah, the third or so, second or something? Yep, absolutely. And okay. He, he recently did a video where uh, he took a clip where Matt and I were sitting on Matt's couch talking about this. Yeah, it's on my screen right now. You've probably seen it. Yeah, it's, it's a good... I'm watching yeah. So, in fact, on my Twitter profile, I think I even say provisional atheist, largely because of the work that Ozzy has done, uh, diving deep into what those labels mean. But listen, yeah, I mean, that's we're, we're, we are beating we're we're beating this thing to death. Most people don't even know what an atheist is. I, my neighbors moved in once, and the first, they asked if what kind of church we go to, and I said, "Well, I'm an atheist," and they said, "Is that like a Scientologist?" <laughs> They they don't That's even funny. they don't even know what the, these words mean. So, but yes, once you start getting into the community and and the, and the, these labels are important, and then people are kind of divvying up in factions, and then then like like we're really detailed on labels and what they mean. That's when I think a numerical scale could be helpful. 
Um, but this, th there's confusion. There's so much confusion around these labels. There, there, there this is. This topic comes up time and time again. Well, and, and you, you find yourself in these weird conversations where you ask, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm not, I'm not religious, I'm not atheist, I'm agnostic, and they don't have that definition that you have. You know, they have a, a, a colloquial sense of what agnosticism is, which e is yeah. pretty much what most atheists would accept. They say they're open and they're undecided, yeah. usually. And but but if you ask an agnostic, somebody does say, hey, I'm, I'm agnostic, and you can ask them, do you believe in any gods? And they would probably say no. Yeah. Which would meet the w definition. Which would answer the atheism question. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's... that's not true. They don't believe in any gods. It's different than believing gods that don't exist. Just kind of, I mean, it's a really small semantic distinction, mm -hmm. but people don't really, just the every average everyday conversation, they're not really going to get into that much. Okay. Of, uh, I, I actually have a question for, for both of you. Um, sure. So when, when it comes to that, I, I, I find um, as a thought experiment, it's fantastic. Um, but when it comes to, you know, the rubber hitting the road, you know, if you have a 0.999% uh, percent chance of, you know, a specific deity being real, um, you're not going to live your life as if that deity is real, right? Of course not. So in action, it's a zero. It's not, if, if you wanted to, to put it that way, I mean, w w when we have a choice to wake up every morning and, and, and live our lives a specific way, Right? Some people live it, a lot, you know, religious people live it assuming that a God exists, and non religious people uh, live it the other way around. So, what's, I mean, what's the benefit of labels? Of that? I mean, I mean really, it, it just feels like it's polluting, you know, it's, it's, it's causing further stratification of uh, yeah. the community. I, th I think that's a good point. Like, yeah, we should be looking at the behavior that people have based on the beliefs that they hold. Rather than get so wrapped up, yeah, in labels. Like, how are they voting? Like how, what are they? What are their views on this particular particular issue? What do they feel? What are their views on teaching a certain holy book in a public school? Right. Uh, okay. So, so, yeah, so, so the show's main question: you know, what you believe and why. This kind of dodges that whole semantic distinction. That's great, yeah. right there. Well, and, and 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 definitely, as long as we're kind of on the same page, that we can have this discussion. But when it comes down to it, we're in the same boat. You know, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, what I think is important is moving people off of these these edges of certainty. An atheist who is they know there's no God, or a theist who knows that there's a God. Mm -hmm. Those th those very rigid. I'm not going to even listen to anything to change my mind, and I'm absolutely sure that it's true, and it's this way, and everyone else is wrong. Those are the danger areas. Those, those are the, that's where I get concerned when, when people start expressing absolute certainty. It's refreshing to meet a theist who says they're eighty percent sure that their God is real. Yeah, that is refreshing. And it's refreshing to meet an atheist who says, uh, "Yeah, I guess a God could exist." I mean, it, again, it all depends on the definition of the God, but I, I just think mm -hmm. that that the activist push for the non-position position of atheism is something that kind of annoys me when people do spend time thinking about their beliefs and justifying them and people routinely justify them and then just take a non-position. It just m makes atheists look like we're not skeptics and critical thinkers and we're just kind of, as Ozzy would say, playing hide the ball. Right, right. I th yeah. I think I, I think I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, we we as atheists have an obligation to recognize that, uh, you know, we don't we don't hold certainty in the, these beliefs, and um, that we really do have a belief that you know, we're holding a belief that just there's because we don't hold certainty, we're not still an atheist. We can still be an atheist and not be certain. I mean, I think certainty is just right. ridiculous in lots yeah. of situations. It just says more about how you feel internally, not. Yeah, That's objectively real. Just FYI, I, I've been chatting with Ozzy, and him and I, and Matt and Blake Junta have been trying to do like a like a Google Hangout to go over this idea of these labels and also um, the belief scale that I use when I'm using street epistemology, because I, I noticed Blake using it. He was being interviewed once, and he used this zero to one hundred scale when he was he was like questioning Blake, his his atheist host. 
So, um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. We might be doing something along those lines. Yeah, well, for sure. I like Blake. He's a real honest guy. He seems like he's got, got good intentions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like him. Yeah. Uh, hey, that was pretty much all I had, guys. Yeah, before you go, how did you hear about calling in? Was it something that, on Facebook or Twitter, or was this just a random call in? Yeah, no, I saw your post, Anthony, just a little while ago. Okay. Okay. Great. Great, dude. <laughs> all right, well... Make a comment on there so that I know who you are. Cool. I sure will. Definitely. All right, Jared. Thanks for dialing in, man. Taking my call, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. See ya. Doug. Hey, Doug. Thanks for dialing in. Okay. My pleasure. I was uh, seeing that there's the pre-show call, and I was kind of, or pre-call, whatever, and I was yeah. kind of wondering, is there anyone who you just talk to and, how should I put it, I know that you've been always pretty mild-mannered when I've seen you. Was there anyone who just managed to either infuriate you or get you to the point where you had to walk away just to keep mm. your cool? Well, I'm usually able to maintain my cool with most people while I'm there with them. Uh. Now, when I first started off, like maybe the street preachers in front of the Alamo, they, they really knew mm. how to push my buttons. Uh -huh. But I, I was learning street epistemology, and I, I was just going out for the first time. Uh, but these days, no, I can usually maintain my cool even when I encounter a really confident believer and they're arrogant and they're just going on about how they just know that it's true and or a precept might, might kind of push my buttons. But I'm usually able to keep my cool while I'm talking with them. But then afterwards, uh, I can, I, if I'm live streaming maybe or if you know, they walk away, I might just verbally vent out loud, like, I can't believe people still think like that. This is the problem with this country, and that type of thing. But I try to wait until after the fact. Um, recent examples might be the guy who I met on the trail who believed that marijuana should not be legalized. He was just a very aggressive right-winger. Um, and he wasn't even willing to entertain ideas. So I have a short version of that video and a long version of the video. And in the long version... I turn the camera on myself and I vent a little bit. So yeah, there there are some people that push my buttons, but I have to I try just try to remind myself that um, blowing up at them is not going to help things. Yeah, so kind of a cleansing breath type of thing then. Yeah, I I, I basically like to just vent after they're gone yeah. and, and not take it home yeah. with me. Like I don't want to take that out on my dog or my kids or my wife. Like you know, I'll try to leave that in the field if I can. But it's. I, I try to remind myself that these people are forming these beliefs because they have, they weren't given good tools growing up. So they're victims. They're victims of a faulty methodology. They're victims of a faulty epistemology. So when I remind myself of that, it helps me stay more focused and stay more calm. The other thing that helps, the other thing that helps is knowing that people are likely watching what I'm doing. So like when I go on later with Tracy and if there's a very aggressive caller, knowing that thousands of people will be watching and looking to us as, you know, for, for guidance and like how should I behave when I'm in that situation, that itself helps me stay calm. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that might be one, one thing you want to try is like if you start get, feeling like you're getting riled up, just end the talk or how you would behave if 30 people were watching you right now. And that might help you that, stay a little more calm. It would definitely work with that. I am not in a position like that, but there are times when I will say that when someone walks out, I will literally wander into the back and, you know, okay, cleansing <laughs> breath. Now where do I go from yeah, here? Yeah, exactly. Um, Another question, just because it sounds kind of like you might have done something with this, maybe not. Have you ever seen that uh, book by Bob Altmeyer called The Authoritarians, the one that he put up for free because he thought that uh, the psychological research that came out of it, why authoritarians think the way they do, was so important? No, I haven't. That sounds interesting, though. It is a short read, and wow. Really? He wrote it back in 2006, and the scariest thing is he's writing in 2006. Mm. You read it. You think he could have written either last year or this year? Cool. Are, 
Are you, are you following me on Twitter by any chance or social media? I do. Actually, I followed a number of your um, uh, videos. Okay, because I'm thinking if you tweet me the title of that, then uh, Bingo. I'm more than likely going to listen to it. It's much easier. You know, when you just have something to look back to. Okay. Kind of nice, yeah. Yeah. This is going to be a whirlwind day, and I, I, I think I've even already forgotten the title. So if you could t you know, tweet it at me, may preferably with a link, and then I can, I can retweet it and then go check it out later. With pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Really glad to have you here. My pleasure. Looking forward to a great show. Me too. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. All right. Speaking of uh, remembering titles... Uh, this show is actually named after uh, the audio wizard himself, uh, the King of Clarity. Mm -hmm. um, he who keeps us. Um, there's a light in the dark. He is Vern. The Vern Show. The Vern Show. Welcome to the Vern Show. Yeah, no, this is the Vern Show. This has been the Vern Show, and we're just lucky enough to now and realize I, I it. We've my, always I have been my a magic part of the cube. Show. Have you seen that? <laughs> <laughs> my magic cube. Let's see what happens when I do this. <laughs> I brought this block because it, it ties into a talk that I gave, and people who watch that talk will get it, but it's green, so mm -hmm. it's not going to, it's going to see it. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Tracy will ask what the green block is for. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah. <laughs> What's in the box? Oh. Boop. There's nothing in it. It's just a block. Can we practice running a clip? Okay. So I brought three clips. Uh, we already played the first one. The second uh -huh. clip is only 30 seconds long, so it's very short. But I, I selected it because it's a good example of how I very intently listened to this woman named Carrie, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm repeating back what I think that she said, because I think it's so important for people to hear the words that they've said so that they can think about it. Because sometimes them hearing their words back is the first time that they've actually heard their belief come back to them. And that's what this clip shows. So let's go yeah. ahead and roll clip number two. I'm interested in meeting people that are 100%, or they say they're 100%. Yeah. Because I think knowing something is an extremely difficult thing yeah. to be able to say. Well, one thing I found interesting about our talk, mm -hmm. like just getting real meta here, mm -hmm. you were saying that it sounded like what you were saying, mm -hmm. and if this isn't it, say, Anthony, you're way off, mm -hmm. but it sounded like you were saying is, yeah, I know I'm not 100%, but it's more comfortable to me at 100%. I think, I think that's right on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's a clip. Yeah, so this was me repeating back what she said and then her hearing her own words. And I give her a chance to correct me. Yeah. Like if, if this isn't what you're saying, please let me know. And, and uh, hear that when you're discussing something about God or politics. And uh, I really like showing that clip uh, for that reason. Rock on, man. Do you have any comments on it? Do I have any comments on it? I kind of <laughs> want to see more of it, to be honest. It feels like it's not long it enough. Was, it's I too short. Wanna... It's too short. But but it it's it's just that teasing. To go back and there is a third one. Of it. There's a third clip that's a minute long. But this video is on my channel, so that people can check it out if they want to. They can watch the whole thing in its entirety. Nice, man. Yeah, your 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 style of talking to people is just so zen. I mean, it's it, it really is just this <laughs> soothing come. I try to make people feel safe. You do. Yeah. You do. I felt like an asshole. Like when I was when I was diving in, I was just like, going tear this, <laughs> you know, this cathartic, you know, because some people, well, a lot of I tuned in at first to get that kind of cathartic shredding mm. of arguments mm -hmm. and. See you know, that, that, that comfort, yeah. you know, that, you know, it's safe. Let's talk about this. Yeah. It, it's, um, it feels like it, it, it's a precision strike, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not this overall demolishing. It's getting straight to the heart of yeah. the person you're talking. 
Largely what it is, is to, to make people comfortable mm -hmm. so that we can examine their belief. And if they're being defensive, if they're uneasy, then yeah. you may not get down to the root of why they believe. So it's advantageous to be nice. And I just want to be nice. Like, I, I, can, I can wrap it up and be a jerk. <laughs> sure you can. But I don't really, I, that's just not the point. So uh, it just turns out that it's more effective to be nice. And I just happen to be, I, I think I'm nice and I try to be nice. And You're, I want to be, I, I want to I've, be nice. I've met you on several occasions so far. You come off as an incredibly nice guy. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That I mean, is... I, listen, I can ramp it up if I need to. Uh, just ask my kids. <laughs> but, but no, I think when it comes to examining these beliefs, uh, you, you need to try your best to make people feel open and safe and encourage honesty. And if someone's being defensive, it's one of the worst things that you can encounter if you're trying to uncover the, uh, their foundation for a belief, if someone's being defensive. Yeah. Well, it, 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 that just uh, further underlines the goal. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. That being said, I was gonna say, um, I mean, we're not broadcasting out, but I mean, if this came up during the show, I might use that as, as, a, as a way to encourage more callers. If you've ever been wanting to dial into this show, mm -hmm. uh, I can assure you that I will try to be as respectful and gentle with you as possible. And yet I will challenge you too with questions. So this is a good opportunity to call in and, and have your beliefs questioned. If you've ever been on the fence about calling in, then uh, this is your opportunity. I think they, that's probably going to be the best shot they're going to get because as somebody who's going to be guest hosting or co-hosting, yeah, that, that would be something unique that you would be bringing to the table, I think, mm. is that is a, a, a level of empathy that I haven't really seen. Thanks. So in this third clip, it's a minute long. Mm -hmm. uh, the talk at this point is over, and the big takeaway here is that my interlocutor, Carrie, enjoyed the conversation. And largely without prompting, she just, she talks about how important it is to have talks like this where, where, uh, where a person can, can feel comfortable examining a deeply held belief. And uh, she talks about this idea of the importance of having open conversations. So let's go ahead and run clip number Take three. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're welcome. I have a card here. That's interesting. And that was the five. Okay. Um, if you want to keep talking, I would love to keep examining this belief with you. That's very interesting. What is what is this what is this for? I call it a hobby, but there are thousands of people that are starting to have conversations with people about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Card here. That's interesting. And that, that was way more than five. Okay. Um, if you want to keep talking, I would love to keep examining this belief with you. That's very interesting. What is what is this what is this for? I call it a hobby, but there are thousands of people that are starting to have conversations with people about all sorts of stuff. Politics, yeah. God, karma. I think it's great. Did you enjoy it? I did. Okay. I really did. Well, that's good. What did you like about it? I like that... I think it's just nice to be able to... You know, it's always nice to be listened to. And you're a great listener. Hmm. So, you know? I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. it's always just nice to be able to, sometimes people are so quick to dismiss your ideas and, um, you know, because of their own ideas. And it's very, it's a breath of fresh air to just be able to say what you believe without, I don't feel like you had any condem condemnation or any judgment. Or, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Okay. I, I wish people would have more open conversations about things, politics. Yeah. Yeah. Religion. Yeah. Yeah. All the big, all the biggies. <laughs> all the big okay, we're back. So yeah, she was talking about this idea of having Oprah conversations and and appreciating that she wasn't attacked for expressing her views. And and yeah, that's important. I think it's important if you really want to understand a person and help them reflect on their belief. Then that seems to be the best way to go. As, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one environment. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, definitely for the one-on-one, -on -one and definitely if you're going out and having that conversation and initiating mm. that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it was uh, a big reason why I dove so into research was because I was pissed because somebody wasn't mm. um, respected in that way. So I think that mm. I think there's place for there's there, there's a place for both. 
Um, I, I absolutely see where you're coming from, and especially if you're the one going out. Because yeah, if you're going out and being an asshole to somebody, like... The police will show up pretty soon. Yeah, after. you're just some belligerent <laughs> dude, you know, uh, yelling at people on the street, right? Right. But, uh, so, so having that attitude, especially when you're um, having those one-on-one, those intimate conversations and, 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 and being able to do that, I absolutely see. But mm-hmm. I do have to push back because my experience is different. My experience mm. is that um, some people just are going to be very lazy fair about it, not really do much until something really pisses them off. You know, I was actually talking to Vern, uh, the Vern, the Vern show. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to Vern yesterday and he was saying that, um, uh, that most places will get emails because they really, really love something, really, really mm-hmm. hate it. Mm-hmm. There aren't a lot of people that e- that that email in and go, eh, it's okay, yeah, I watch it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you want to be motivated, like yeah, yeah. So there's a positive and negative. They, motivation. they feel strongly either way. Yeah, yeah. Were you on the receiving end of uh, like a bombastic, aggressive approach in a change, or you, were you giving that out and you've seen it change people? So there were several situations for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of had a really unique situation in that um, I, my parents were divorced and so one side when I visited my mother it was really Christian. I mean it was hardcore. Uh-huh. Um, and when I went to my dad it was me. You know, So I kind of had those breaks. Uh-huh. Right? Um, and I kind of got it from both sides. So my uncle on my mother, be the very Christian side, um, he got the call to be a preacher. He, he got the call to serve the Lord and serve the church. And he was very into apologetics. Mm. And so he practiced on me. Mm. And that forced me into taking the opposite argument. Even though you didn't want to? Like you were, you were trying I was, to? I was an early young teenager. It, 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 I don't think I really put much thought into whether I wanted to or not. But I mean, I just did, did you take a position that you didn't actually hold or you were contesting his apologi- apologetics because you really were questioning them? I think that answer changed over time. Mm. I think it started more like, okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Yeah. Literally and then you're playing like, devil's hey, advocate. I'm, I'm asking some good <laughs> questions here. I'm going to keep this going. And uh, o- over time, that actually helped foster my um, my disbelief, right, my, 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 my finding my way out of it. Um, but that was just one part of a lot of things that led up to that. And so yeah. um, did, I, did I feel um, like I had some really big challenges to my faith while I was a Christian? Yes. But then I also had some really big challenge, you know, big challenges the other way and seeing that and feeling like I'm on both, you know, on one side and then on the other side of a, of a more heated argument. Mm. Um, it pushed me, I think, to make up my own damn mind okay. yeah. <laughs> until I could um, honestly. So, yeah, I do think that all these different approaches affect people differently. Yeah. The very aggressive, in your face, here's the counter apologetics to show how mistaken you are. Mm-hmm. That, could be, that could be compelling, even in a one on one. But generally, if, uh, generally it, 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 it results in the backfire effect. Yeah, well, or, or in, in one-on-ones especially. I mean... In what? In a one-on-one especially. In a one-on-one, yeah. yeah. absolutely. But watching somebody get destroyed, and that person was using the same argument that you use, and you were observing it, and you're not the recipient, like you're just passively watching yeah. it, that could be compelling. There are so many people that don't believe these, these because of that. that because they thing. witnessed that, yeah. Yeah. But I think that there we have an abundance of um, the aggressive and not enough of your approach. And so I'm glad that you're pushing that to have those kinds of conversations in a cordial way. Thank you. Because, um, the, the, it's the different strokes for different folks type of thing. Like, yeah. um, do you ever listen to Seth Andrews? Mm-hmm. I love Seth Andrews. He has an angelic voice. I mean, just listening to him, it's just like a warm hug. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's a pumpkin spice latte hug. Isn't it? It's just soft soothing. and soothing, and it is the voice that I remember uh, from listening to Christian radio. Mm. And because of that, I can't stand it. Um, I, I absolutely love it, but it takes me back to a place that I just yeah. Because because it, 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 I go back to Christian radio and I think about Christian radio in the car with my mother, and it's hard for me to make that oh, okay 
disconnect, and it's just his cadence. It's his tone. Of course, it's not his content. Yeah, you know, the content's completely different. It is, but you know, there are some people who loved that style of yeah. talking, and I think that like if they craved that and they're able to get that, it's that just approach. You know, that yeah. there are people who loved that part of Christianity and being able to get that, but not having to get that the reminds me. Up. There was I was at the FFRF's 35th anniversary in Portland yeah. uh, five years ago. So I think it was in 2012. And Jerry DeWitt had just come out as a, as an atheist. He was a Pentecostal preacher. I remember his, yeah, the, the year as an atheist? No, that's Ryan Bell. Okay, which This one is Jerry, Jerry DeWitt. Uh, he was on Dogma Debate for a while. He wrote uh, Hope After Faith. Yes! Cut the hair. Cool. And they introduced him at FFRF, and he ran up there, and he was doing his Pentecostal thing. You know, praise, praise science. And he was going on, Dar Darwin. And a lot of people were laughing, but afterwards, apparently, a lot of people were upset by it because yeah. he was channeling that, that religious zeal mm -hmm. that so many people in the audience were turned off by. And I think he was a little surprised oh, that, yeah. that this didn't come across as a joke. I would be super uncomfortable yeah. thinking about myself in that position. Because or they have a spouse that still believes, and they thought oh, he was mocking them. So you have to be so careful with humor.